Um, and so before I get into my prepared remarks, Rob asked me to give you a little bit of additional color around, um, around my history and my background. Um, I graduated, I was one of those people that, that in undergraduate studied something that I really enjoyed with really no plan. And uh, I do have an undergraduate degree in biology. When I graduated from college, I, I was uh, married with a baby on the way. And uh, I was mostly concerned with finding a way to pay the rent. And I went to work doing the only thing I really was trained to do. That was working in a laboratory. Quickly figured out that that wasn't the thing for me. I was being called on by some companies who had salespeople who were selling laboratory-based products. They asked me if I would be interested in interviewing for a job. I said, yes. I interviewed. They offered me a job paying me $15,000 a year with a company car. I thought I hit the lottery and took it. 20 years later, I, I left that company, and so I really focused on trying to build my experience, realizing over the years that it is a competitive market, and I was a salesperson and then moved for the first time to, to, to do a product management job, moved to get my first sales management job, moved back to do a marketing management job, moved to Hong Kong to do a general management job, moved back to the U.S. and managed R&D, moved a couple of other times. And so all of that was built on, was just built on trying to make sure I was a, comp as competitive a commodity as possible. Nowhere along the way did I have a plan, except to make sure that I understood what I wanted to do the next job or two. But it w wasn't really about the job, it was more about the experience I needed to gain in order to make sure that I was the most competitive commodity I could be as I built my, my career. And so uh, toward the end of my Abbott experience and then at Fisher, I, I developed some competence around turning businesses around. That's what brought me to Luminex, uh, which was in pretty bad shape when I got here. We're doing a lot better now. And, uh, and so along the way, uh, what I was really focusing on was just trying to be as good as I could be at the job I was doing at the time. <clears throat> no strategy. That's it. When we're done, if you have any additional questions about that aspect, I'd be glad to answer them. Now let me get into my uh, prepared remarks. So um, we're at an interesting time in history, in my view. Uh, and you'll see in the title of my, um, my first slide here the, the word convergence. And we'll talk about this as we go through my, my, um, my presentation today. But it's really around te uh, technology convergence and in particular uh, its relevance in this field that we call life science. And it's really interesting that we're having this conversation now. To help me, um, to help me tell the story here, I want to introduce you to somebody. Anybody recognize this face? Let me show you if, um, another image you may be more familiar with. How about now? Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin is famous because on November 24th, 1859, almost exactly 150 years ago today, was the publication of The Origin of Species, which, if you're familiar with that particular work, uh, is famous today, but when it, the date it was published was met with pretty much a standing yawn. Today, it's hard to believe that the origin of species would be viewed that way, but it was, in fact, considered at the time not to be that big a deal. And one of the reasons is because of the way it came about. <clears throat> one of the things that, one of the reasons why I started with that original image of Charles Darwin is because people think of Charles Darwin with this photo, but Charles Darwin was 22 when he left the UK on the Beagle to travel around the world with Captain Fitzroy and do all the stuff that we all remember that he did with the Galapagos and all that stuff, right? And you remember the images of, the, for those of you who are interested in this sort of thing the way I am, the images on the right are the famous finches that sort of brought the, brought the issue of, of natural selection to light for, uh, for Darwin. But the interesting thing about this whole story is um, that as a result of his experiences, he, he came to the conclusion of natural selection and the fact that there, that there is no such thing as the immutability of species, the concept of an animal being put on the earth by some divine being and never changing. is what. It, and so he refuted the idea of the immutability of species. And one of the reasons why people remember Darwin with that image with the long gray beard is because from the time he got back to the UK until he published The Origin of Species was 20 years. 
Why? Because Charles was a bit of a screw-up. I don't know if you knew this or not, but he was the son of a prominent physician, well-to-do family. His older brother, Erasmus, was, was a really good guy, off on the right track. Charles tried the physician thing, didn't work. Screwed that up, tried to be a minister, because that was sort of prestigious enough for a, for a well-to-do family. Didn't do that very well, but he was really interested in this naturalism that was all the rage in the UK at the time. So through a series of steps, he got on the Beagle. His dad agreed to pay for it after some people convinced his dad it was the right thing to do. He left on a, on a two-year voyage. It turned out to be five. Came back to, the, to London, and because it, naturalism was so popular at the time, Charles Darwin was the toast of the town. So this guy that got on the Beagle at the age of 22 as a screw-up came back and everybody wanted to meet with him and he was invited into, into the, the parlors of all the, the highest level of London society and Charles was digging the parties. And he didn't, wasn't really interested in screwing that up and so because many of his mentors were prominent members or, or prominent within the Church of England and what the implications of the immutability of species and so on, Charles said, you know, I think I'm just going to keep this to myself. But he was also a bit of a hypochondriac, so he wrote The Origin of Species, gave a copy to his wife, and said, if I die like I think might happen literally any day, make sure this gets published. 20 years go by, he gets a, a letter from somebody in the Malay archipelago, what is now modern-day Malaysia, a friend of his who basically describes what is known as, the, as natural selection. He says, uh-oh. Better get this published, gets it published. Everybody responds with a standing yawn. Today, however, that work is basically the foundation upon which what is today all the progress that has been, been made in natural sciences. The convergence that I'm talking about was really laid at the, its foundation was laid by Darwin in this particular work. But through the centuries, there's been a lot of progress made. The century of the 1700s, I will describe as the century of biology. This is a photograph of Robert Hooke, who built on the invention of Van Leeuwenhoek, the microscope, and described the cell. Many other additional uh, areas of progress have been made over the centuries. The 1700s was a critical century for the science of biology, followed by the next, de the next century, which was a century of Chemistry, this is a, an image of John Dalton, who is the, uh, around the atomic theory, and he described, as you can see from his writings, he described what we now know as the atom and laid the foundation for what Linus Pauling got an, uh, a Nobel Prize for in the 1950s around the chemical bond. Which brings us to the 1900s, which was the century of physics. Everybody recognizes that gentleman. But a lot of progress, whether you want to talk about the, the, the age of computing or the understanding of the concepts of physics, really congealed in the 1900s. Which brings us to the century that we're in now, which I will describe as the century of life science where a lot of these technologies converge. Anybody know who this is? Francis Collins, who is now the, the director of the National Institutes of Health, but is most famous as, and, is, and is called the father of the Human Genome Project. So the Human Genome was published in 2003. This is an example of some of, the, some of the output there, none of which would have been possible if it hadn't been for the biological discoveries over time, the chemical discoveries over time, and most importantly, the physics discoveries over time because the issue with the Human Genome Project was not the science, it was the data and, and being able to have the electronic capability to manage all that data. So if you look at science through the centuries, this is an example of some of the, of a timeline that displays some of the, a, a very small portion of the major discoveries in the various dis, uh, scientific disciplines which bring us to the moment that we're in now, which is the convergence of all those techn technologies in the application of life science. And in particular, the human genome and a term you'll become more familiar with in the, in, in, in the very near future, the human proteome. So the human genome, of course, 
is the understanding of where, where all the genes and, and, and the makeup of the human genome. The human proteome, however, is what really matters. What really matters is biological function. And when I say that, what I mean is the Human Genome Project, imagine, is like publishing a phone book. What's the benefit of a phone book? You can, you can cross-reference the data. Unfortunately, this phone book, the human genome, looks like this, which is I have a lot of phone numbers, but I have absolutely no idea what phone number goes with which name and which address. So it's important to have a list of the phone numbers, right? But the human proteome is really about understanding the function, what the human genome does, and, what, and how it manages life as we know it. A lot of people are trying to make money at this. This is a list of Forbes, from Forbes of 2009's fastest growing technology companies in America. We're proud to be, to be number 20 on the list. The point of all this is, however, that there is a lot of investment being made across a number of different firms. There's several biotech firms on the list, including Luminex, around this concept, which is built around being able to understand what the linkage is between the numbers in the phone book and the names and addresses. Which is particularly relevant given the moment that we're in right now in history in this country around health care reform. Now, I'm sure everybody in the room has an opinion about health care reform. One of the things that in my judgment is a little misunderstood about what we currently refer to as health care reform is it's really not health care reform. It's really health insurance reform. Because what we're talking about is how to pay for it, right? We're not really talking about how to reform it, how to reform the delivery of health care and how to use the, the knowledge that's been gained over the, over the centuries and particularly over the last couple of decades in order to make sure we deliver health care in a more effective, more just way. However, there are some bright lights on the horizon, and I want to introduce you to one of those, which is the concept of personalized medicine. Now, I'm not a pharmaceutical guy, but uh, I understand a little bit about how, how pharmaceuticals work. And pharmaceuticals, and, and more importantly, the administration of therapy is an important part of the healthcare process. So the principle around personalized medicine, simply stated, is that when a person presents to the healthcare system, they're administered a therapy in the form of, of, of a prescription. But we all know that there are such a thing as adverse, event, adverse effects, side effects from any compound. They're in the label. Why is that? Because not, not everyone is affected by a compound the same way. This is a graphic that explains that in some cases, the drug can be toxic and not beneficial. It can be toxic but still beneficial. It can be not toxic and not beneficial, and then most importantly, it can be not toxic and actually solve the problem. But because of the way pharmacology works, not everybody is affected the same way. Here's an example. Tamoxifen goes by the trade name Taxol, which is a breast cancer compound. Some of you may know someone who's, been, who's uh, taken Tamoxifen. And this graphic is, is an example of data from a peer-reviewed scientific article that, that shows on the y-axis of all these graphs is survival rate expressed in percent of the population. Across the x-axis is the months. So at, every mo at, any, at any moment in time, how many, what percentage of the po people in the population have, have survived? And you can see the low risk of recurrence versus the high risk of recurrence in, uh, low risk of recurrence in blue, high risk of recurrence in red. And what is not shown here is that the differences between these populations is their genetic profile. What that basically means is, coming back to the, to the human genome and the human proteome, is that genes basically instruct the cells to produce proteins. Proteins could be a number of different things. If the body's not working right, it could be a cancer marker. Everybody has perhaps heard of PSA which is a prostate cancer marker. That's a, pro that's a protein that is produced by the prostate gland when the cells in the prostate gland are cancerous. 
you measure PSA, it's a indica good indication of whether the patient has prostate cancer or not. That all happens in this type of very simple cascade of gene to protein, <coughs> as you can see. Another example of proteins that are generated in normal healthy conditions are thyroid hormones. So the, the DNA in the cell, in this case the pituitary gland, instruct the pituitary gland to generate thyroid stimulating hormone, which does exactly what its name implies, stimulates the thyroid to generate thyroid hormone. Another example of how genes regulate protein production. But in this case, the proteins we're talking about are enzymes. So what enzymes do is they basically facilitate metabolism, break down, in this case, break down drugs. And so what, if you take those same data I showed you a couple of slides ago, you'll see that tamoxifen efficacy by genetic profile is shown here with, again, on the y-axis, the percentage of patients that have those different uh, profiles and the percentage that uh, have relapse-free survival and overall survival. And the only difference between these are this group of patients has the STAR4, STAR4 mutation. This group of patients has the wild-type, wild-type mutation. And this type has the wild type star 4 mutation. Because everybody remembers from biology, right, that you get your, your, your DNA from your, your parents, right? So the reason why it's expressed as two pieces is because one comes from, from each parent. And so what this basically means is that some of these patients metabolize tamoxifen well and others don't simply based on what their genetic profile is. That's all great and very interesting, and one would think that that's a great opportunity to make sure that we administer the right therapy to the right patient at the right time, to make sure that before you spend, spend money and waste time administering a drug to somebody that may, who may not benefit from that drug, it will be very valuable information to know, right? The problem is that the U.S. healthcare system is procedure-based. What that means is when, when healthcare is delivered in this country, you get paid for doing stuff. You don't get paid for not doing stuff. And sometimes not doing something is the right thing. So I have a brother who happens to be an orthopedic surgeon. He lives in op and practices in Lexington, Kentucky. The example, my brother's name is John. My, John's example is if I see a patient, he operates on on patients from eastern, eastern Kentucky, a lot of them are from, you know, poor areas where for a variety of reasons, socioeconomic and, and dietary, there's a lot of obesity there, so it wears out the joint, so a lot, of, a lot of them require knee replacements, hip replacements, and so on. He describes that a common occurrence for him is he sees a patient, their knee is hurting. He says, you know, it's a matter of time before you need to have that knee replaced, but I think we can, we can hold off for four or five years. The most common occurrence is the patient says, thank you very much, walks down the street, finds an orthopedic surgeon who will put the knee in. Why? Because you get paid for doing stuff. Now, the question is, what's the right thing for the patient? What's the right thing for the healthcare system? And although a lot of people in the healthcare system uh, are, in the, are in healthcare for a reason because they believe in the principles around delivering healthcare and, and, and helping their fellow man, it's also true that financial incentives work, right? So the fact that the U.S. healthcare system is procedure-based is a fundamental problem that I think has to be addressed as we address the healthcare reform issue. And I believe that life sciences using the personalized medicine area as one small example represents a tremendous opportunity. The problem is that with this procedure-based issue is that Hippocrates might object, right? Because the Hippocratic Oath starts with first do no harm, right? The fundamental principle around, the, around Hippocrates is the first thing you want to do is do no harm. And unfortunately, there, in, in today's healthcare system in the United States, the issue is it's all about the do. In order to reform healthcare, we have to, we have to back up a little bit, make sure that we do what I believe is personally the right thing and the ethical thing and the moral thing, which is to make sure that we guarantee healthcare delivery for all Americans. But let's make sure we do it the right way. And while we're paying for it, let's also figure out a way to do it better. Good news is that help is on the way. This is an example of um, reproductions of headlines. You'll see here, for example, that 
Uh, Medco, which is a company who is in the business of delivering pharmaceuticals, and they're not a pharmaceutical company, they're what's called a pharmacy benefit manager. So they manage the, the delivery of pharmaceuticals to patients based on their health care coverage, is in the process of doing a study that we're working closely with them on for Plavix. Plavix is a compound you may be familiar with. It's an anticoagulant. You see it advertised for it. You see it advertised on television where they show the picture of the artery and the platelets adhering to the wall of the artery and all that stuff. That's Plavix. And so Plavix is, is, has some of the same issues that Tabaxifen does. Some patients respond, some patients don't. And so Medco is starting to do the work so that they can make sure that before they actually pay for the drug to be administered to a patient, that they can ensure that the patient will benefit. And more, more importantly, that they, that they will evaluate what, what makes more sense because Plavix works in some cases. Effient, which is a lily, lily drug, works in other, in other cases. Effient has one problem, and that is it creates bleeding events, right? So, so uh, if a physician prescribes uh, Plavix versus Effient, you want to make sure that not only they will benefit, but also that they won't be harmed by the compound. And all that has to be considered in today's regulatory climate. I won't dwell on the regulatory climate except to say that for those of us who do this for a living, uh, an, an additional factor we have to consider is the regulatory situation, the, the regu the Regulatory body in this case is the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, which I think that, uh, by and large does a pretty good job. Uh, one of the problems is uh, that, that it's actually based on uh, what I call rearview mirror navigation. There was a, uh, an act passed in 1976 that was around what's called the predicate device model. So that basically means that you can ensure swift and, and rapid review of your medical device in this case if you can demonstrate that your product compares favorably to a product that was cleared prior to 1976. Now the issue is a lot of the stuff we're talking about today didn't exist in 1976 and we and I can tell you my company has direct experience with presenting a product that is significantly better than the pre-1976 technologies but because our our answers are different they're viewed by the by FDA as being wrong. And so as part of this whole healthcare reform idea, one of the things that we're advocating for in Washington and elsewhere is let's figure out a way to deliver healthcare more efficiently, but let's also figure out a way to make sure that we ad take advantage of the technological innovations to ensure that we can deliver healthcare more efficiently and more effectively. So here's the timeline again, and where we sit right now is basically on the cusp of the century of life science where the improvements in chemistry and in biology and in physics over the years are creating this environment where we can not just map the human genome but understand why it's important, use that information to, to, to improve the way in which we make, we deliver healthcare and improve the ways in which we uh, have a favorable impact on, on the lives of our fellow citizens. And the good news is that although we have a lot of progress we make, to make, we've made some pretty good progress driven by the, the investment in research and development. Uh, my company and all the other companies in the space are not shown on this page. You'll see we're talking about billions of dollars here and what's happened with the NIH budget. Now that budget is being guided by Francis Collins, the father of the human genome or the head of the human genome project. So you can rest assured a lot of that investment will go into smaller companies and academic institutions that are doing research, the type of research that we're talking about today. And that will lead to significant improvements. We have made nice progress over the years. You'll see the treatment for these different conditions per the Merck Manual of 1899, where the treatment, the leading causes of death were heart disease and infectious disease with antibiotics. We've had a very nice effect on, on infectious disease, but heart disease and now cancer create big problems. The treatment for diabetes at the time was arsenic. Now it's insulin and blood glucose monitoring and other, and, and other treatments. For asthma, per the Merck Manual, in 1899, the appropriate treatment was tobacco. Today, it's corticosteroids, inhalers. For cardiac disease, it was cocaine. Today, it's statins, which are anti-cholesterol drugs, stents, which are medical devices, and cabbage, which is uh, coronary bypass. And my personal favorite, the treatment for insomnia back in 1899 or 1900 was cannabis. Today, it's uh, compounds that we would know by names, names like Lunesta and Ambien. So with all that said, with all the convergence and all the progress we made over the years, we are at a pivotal moment where we can not only make significant contributions to society,
but also solve some, some, some just as significant public policy questions that are in front of us. And if we do it the right way, and we invest in the right things, and we reform while we also figure out a way to pay for it, I'm confident that we'll be able to make the right decision and be able to leverage innovation as these technologies converge. Thank you very much. Personally, I'm, I personally believe that the, the route out of the wilderness here includes leveraging the principles upon which our company, our, our country was founded, which include things like free enterprise. You know, I believe the profit motive and, and the risk and reward mechanisms of capitalism are very powerful forces. Um, and so uh, with that said, it's also true that uh, to be able to achieve that is very difficult um, if you try to do it all yourself. And so um, I, I, my company in particular believes that um, it's important for us to make sure that we do what we call manage the art of the possible. What that basically means is let's understand what we are good at and make sure that we leverage that as much as we can. And when we identify an area that is, that is a requirement for success, but not something that we're good at, a core competence, for, you know, to, for lack of a better term, that we find someone who is and do our best to collaborate with them. And, and what does that mean? Collaboration is sort of vague. But it means, depending on the company, it means that we put a deal together where we do some risk sharing, where we share some of the R&D investment that will, based on customer requirements, to deliver a particular product that looks and acts and behaves and performs in a particular way where we understand what they're going to do, what we're going to do, and we have milestones that we agree to. All, or in smaller companies, we have a very strong balance sheet with a strong cash position. We can make equity investments in smaller companies that might be more collaborative or more um, entrepreneurial and, and, and using some of the technology convergence we're talking about here to solve problems in a unique way. And so uh, uh, the last thing is we, ha we get exposed to a lot of that just because we have a, a partnership model, business model that we use. What that basically means is, think of it like Intel, right? We license our technology to other companies who then use our technology to deliver applications to the end user. And we make money by selling that company products and then having them pay us a royalty. While in other markets, we actually develop the product for the end user, right? And so because we're good at that, that partnership thing, we get exposed to some more of those opportunities than other companies might. But I think it's a I think it's a very important thing that this problem is too big for any one person or any one company to solve it. Andrew. There's been a lot of advancements in pharmaceuticals in the past couple decades. And uh, recently, you know, they've kind of come under fire under public scrutiny for you know, making too much money, being too aggressive in the capital structure. Is that a, a similar model, you think, for life cycle or life sciences companies going forward? Or is there a, a different strategy that perhaps will well, I think that, yeah, uh, well, first of all, um, I don't work for a pharmaceutical company. But I will start by saying that um, w when I was at Kellogg, um, second best business school in the country, um, the, uh, when I was at Kellogg, one of my professors had this saying, which is, you always have to keep in mind that some industry, by definition, has to be the most profitable. The question is, what does it say about your country or your economic system if you know, the, potato, the potato chip industry is the most profitable, or if the tobacco industry is the most profitable, or if the pharmaceutical industry is the most profitable? So I'm not sure I agree, um, having never really worked in that industry. I don't think I really ag necessarily agree that it's a bad thing that the pharmaceutical industry is the most profitable. Now, I, I grant you that. There's some things that are upside down about the way that, that, the way that industry is structured because it is a fundamental truth that the U.S. consumer pays for the innovation and because other countries have put, in, put, 
price controls in effect and all that stuff, and I'm not going to comment on that. But I'll just start by saying I'm not sure it's fun, you know, it's, it's intrinsically bad that pharmaceutical companies are the most profitable or, or, or are profitable. Um, I think the other thing that's different about that industry versus the industry that we're in is the rate at which technology moves. And so it's typically, it's, it's true in our industry that the technology life cycles are two or three years long. You know, there are literally, you know, billion dollar segments of the industry in my industry that didn't exist two years ago. And, uh, and that's not really true in pharmaceuticals, and, and that's not a value judgment. It's just that based on the fact that pharmaceuticals are ingested and therefore have the regulatory regulations that they have, um, and, and the length of the, those, those regulatory cycles and clinical trials and all that stuff is, I think, you know, it just is what it is. Uh, and for all those reasons, technology doesn't move nearly as quickly. Um, and uh, I do think, though, that the structure of the pharmaceutical industry, it may take a generation, but I think the structure of the pharmaceutical industry will change because of this personalized medicine idea and others. Where, and you hear people like uh, John Lechleiter, who's the CEO of Lilly, for example, and, uh, and others who talk about the fact that the blockbuster, the days of the blockbuster drug are, are numbered. And they believe the future is really going to be using this personalized medicine idea to have many hundred to two hundred million dollar compounds rather than three or four billion dollar compounds. And, and they believe that that's a strategic, strategically a good thing for them as a business. Because if you have a billion dollar compound and you don't, fi you don't find another one that can replace it, then as soon as it comes off patent, right, 80% of your value goes away in a very short period of time. So with all that said, I think the, I think the, 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 the issues of, um, uh, that have uh, created the pharmaceutical industry, the structure of that industry are fundamentally different than, than, than the industry that we're in. Um, yes. Uh, I think the issue is really going to be um, the weighting of those. I mean, pharmaceutical companies are already our customers. Um, and, uh, and they're using the genetic data from the patients in their, in their trials and so on uh, to their benefit. I had on the slide, I didn't mention it, but I had on the FDA slide uh, a word, I think, that said critical path or critical path initiative. And that was actually an initiative that was started a number of years ago by the then commissioner of FDA, Mark McClellan, native of Austin, um, and uh, who was then commissioner of FDA. And he put the critical path initiative, which includes things like uh, including genetic data in the clinical trial data. Um, because he was convinced, and I think he was a visionary in this way, that if you, if you had the clinical, if you had the, the genetic data, genetic profile of the patients in a clinical trial in the data, then when we understand, when we fill out the pages of the phone book, that data will eventually become very valuable. But you have to start somewhere. And so uh, Mark decided that it was a good thing to do. And so pharmaceutical companies are already our customer. Um, I think uh, um, with the passage of GINA, which is the Genetic Non-Discrimination Act, then insurance companies will become our customer uh, because they'll be precluded from using any genetic information in what I'll call a negative way. You know, to, to use genetic information to figure out who has what disease and then excluding them from coverage. Um, and that, President Bush actually signed GINA uh, 18 months ago. And so I think farmers and, and Medco and, and, and Medco's customers who are the insurance companies are becoming increasingly our customer. Um, anybody here had their, 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 their genome mapped besides me? Yeah, so there's, I think we ask that question in five years when we fill in the pages of the phone book and understand what the, you know, the, the human proteome better, then I think that will, be, uh, consumers will become <coughs> customers of genetic information much more so than they, than they have been today. I mean, the, I talk about the human proteome is an interesting factoid. There are 15,500 or so proteins, human proteins that have been characterized and the actual function of of those, fit, the number that it, whose function is actually understood is a little over 4,000. And so understanding the function of those, in, those incremental proteins will be really, really important. So what's happening at the cellular level is, of course, the DNA is saying, you know, produce these proteins and then there's a lot of them that are produced that we don't really know what function they do. And so as we, 
as we understand that better, I think that will all become um, very valuable consumer information. One of the debates in healthcare information technology right now is about the possible value of the semantic web. Tim Berners-Lee, the inventor of the World Wide Web, is proposing as the next step for the web. Is this something your company is investing in? Do you see it in terms of cost-benefit analysis as worth your time, worth your R&D money? Um, well, I'm probably not going to answer your question, but clearly information technology in general is an important part of our industry and our company. You know, when I, um, for those of you who are, who are in the, who come out of the technology industry, um, the, uh, there are companies in, and Luminex doesn't happen to be one of these, who are in the business of generating genome-wide association study types of products. And those, uh, there's a single pieces of instrumentation that generate every day a terabyte of data. A terabyte. And the problem with it, you generate a terabyte of data on Monday and then you generate another terabyte on Tuesday, you better have the, tech, the, the information technology to do something with all that, with all that data. And, and uh, the use of um, more creative approaches of information technology, including what you mentioned, I think, is, go is going to be an ever-evolving evolving trend. Um, and particularly as it relates to the collaboration question, I think. Um, and that's already being leveraged to, a, to a, s a limited degree. But over time, I think it will become even more important. I must acknowledge I'm not an expert in that particular field. So um, I, 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 I primarily think of um, the management of data as uh, as an important thing to deliver to my customer rather than uh, as a strategic advantage. Hey, what do you think has to happen for the procedure based delivery uh, healthcare delivery system to be overall? What role does your company and other companies like yours play in that, in that process? Well, um, the, uh, I don't know. Uh, except to say that I think uh, there are many people who understand um, fundamentally that the U.S. healthcare system is procedure-based and all the things that we just talked about. It's also true that for companies like ours, um, you know, we're, we're growing fast and all that stuff, but we're not Johnson & Johnson. Right? And so there are a lot of companies who are much bigger than Luminex is, who have built their entire multi-billion dollar enterprise around the concept of a procedure-based healthcare system. And so the likelihood that there'll be a dramatic shift away from what is a procedure-based system to one that is, you know, where um, physicians or healthcare providers are, have the appropriate financial incentives for keeping people healthy uh, I think is probably generational, to be honest. Um, I think we have to figure out a way to solve both problems simultaneously, but, rec but, but realizing and as we do manage the art of the possible, you know, as much as we would like things to be different, they are the way they are. And I think it's gonna, be, it's gonna have to happen on an incremental uh, basis. Um, if you're interested in that sort of stuff and you're a bit of a, you know, a public policy person, if you have a chance to read Mark McClellan's writings, Mark's at the Brookings Institution. And so just so those of you know, he's a UT grad, uh, has a master's in public health from the Harvard, uh, from Harvard, has a, a year later got his MD from Harvard and has a PhD in economics from Stanford and was commissioner of FDA and then head of CMS, which is, which is the reimbursement authority. And, 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 is, so, and is an MD and an economist, of course. So in my, in my mind, this is a guy who is uniquely qualified to be able to connect all those dots and figure out a way for, for us to map a course for us to get from here to there. And he's at the Brookings Institution in DC now, and if you have a chance to read any of his writings or, or hear him speak, I would recommend that you do so. But what Mark says, he talks about this incrementalism idea. And so what we have to do is recognize that, that we have to, uh, it's difficult to turn this thing on a dime and part of it is economic, and part of it is political, and part of it is uh, the, will, the will of the American people. You know, everybody thinks about this healthcare idea as being, they think it's a really good idea as long as it doesn't affect them. So the American people politically, in my, my judgment, are not 
where they need to be in order to say, okay, I'm willing to, I personally am willing to give some things up or make some sacrifices in order to help my neighbor. Um, and, and at some point, I think that will happen, but in the meantime, I think it'll happen more incrementally. The role that we play um, is in the way that we research and develop products. We have a couple of maxims that we use, and we will not develop a product unless it does two things. Improves healthcare outcomes and reduces cost. Not or reduces cost, and reduces cost. And so if we develop products that improve outcomes and reduce cost, regardless of what form healthcare reform takes, including if it doesn't happen, we believe that that's a fundamentally winning strategy. So the role that we believe is in the interest of developing a competitive differentiated product is for us to make sure that we're part of the solution here rather than part of the problem, to use that trite phrase. Following on what you were saying, uh, and I'm sorry, I missed the beginning of your, your presentation, but uh, certainly in the, uh, in the testing area, there is a debate about how we want to validate the gene condition of gene disease uh, patients. And I, I was wondering, when you said that you don't develop the product unless uh, the options are there, and I'm just talking about the possibility of Who's facing healthcare and economics? So maybe I can, I can answer your question with an example. Go ahead. Sure. And then secondly, this issue of validation and validation of Um, well, the, the answer to your second question uh, is that um, we believe that in order, for, um, in order for the data to be accepted, it has to be done in an independent, third-party, peer-reviewed way. So when we deal with FDA, for example, we develop a lot of products that FDA has never seen before. And so in order for us to get the FDA to clear those products, we ha uh, it's impossible for us to demonstrate to them, based on, a pr uh, on the predicate device model that I mentioned, uh, how it compares to a previously cleared product because ne they don't have one. So what we have in place is a system by which, totally independent of them and us, there are, is a minimum number of peer-reviewed articles in a, in a given list of recognized scientific journals um, that that demonstrate uh, the clinical validity of whatever, whatever it is that we're doing. Um, and so whether that's the right solution or not, I can't really say. But I think it's, in, in principle, it's, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a key, and, and I think it's a good idea uh, that, that there is an independent third-party way to validate the clinical significance of whatever the genetic information may be. In the answer to the first part of your question about how do we do go about figuring out that it does reduce costs and improve uh, outcomes is we use some, you know, uh, healthcare economic types of stuff. But I, maybe, maybe the best way to do that is, is to give you an example. So we have in the pipeline a product that, is, uh, that can detect simultaneously uh, by extracting the DNA out of the organisms whether a patient has one of 25 or so different fungal pathogens. Now, the patients in this case are typically Hospitalized, hospitalized patients that are immune suppressed primarily as a result of transplants or chemotherapy or, or HIV infections or whatever. P point is that their immune systems aren't working correctly. And in most cases, those patients also happen to be in the worst possible place they could be in the hospital, right? Because that's where a lot of sick people are. And one of the problems that those patients have is that they get fungal infections that you or I would fight off easily because we have healthy immune systems. 
So we have a, a member of our scientific advisory board who's at the Cleveland Clinic who does the second most transplants in the world after the University of Pittsburgh. He describes a problem this way. He's the head of pathology at Cleveland Clinic. And he describes a problem this way, which is, so Pat, the problem I have is the patient gets the fungal infection. They don't exhibit symptoms for about 48 hours. So it's been raging for 48 hours. Today, I have to, send, I have to if, I, if I can diagnose by symptomology that the patient has a fungal infection, I send it to the lab, they do a blood culture, it takes five days. By the time I get the result back, I basically, in more, more cases than not, I have a conversation with the patient about why they lost their organ or with the patient's family about why I lost the patient. And the problem is that the five days it takes to do blood culture, which is, is just a function of biology, right? I mean, the way, the way fungi work. We have a product that can, in the sample, extract the DNA, and in a matter of a couple of, couple of hours, using some of the technologies we talked about, determine definitively which one of those 25 pathogens is present. That's clinically important because there is no broad spectrum antifungal that a physician can administer to the patient to, to, to knock out what, uh, all of the different yeasts and molds that might be causing the infection. Um, and so the, the outcome of that is that if we can get that product cleared by FDA, and that's a pretty big if, but if we can get that product cleared by FDA, the outcome is that we, we save the healthcare system the cost of conducting about a $400,000 kidney transplant that just blew up in a week, save the healthcare system the money of putting that patient back on kidney dialysis, 70% of organ transplants are kidneys, or whatever the cost of, of saving the patient's life is. And at a minimum, we, we save the healthcare system the cost of keeping that patient in intensive care versus a less costly place in the hospital. And so when we identify the opportunities, we use healthcare economics, like what's the cost of a transplant, what's the cost of a, of a repeat transplant, what's the cost of dialysis, what's the cost of ICU versus a less costly unit in the hospital, et cetera. Now, that's a pretty easy example, but that's the principle that we use. We try to use hard, hard data like that. At what point will we be able to take sequence data from like any of us in this room and be able to use it to predict the likelihood of having adverse effects from a medication? Well, the degree to which the, the, the mutations themselves are known and understood, <coughs> like the ones I showed, the star 4 mutations for tamoxifen, the degree to which those are known and understood and documented in the peer-reviewed literature, you could do that today. I think the sequence data is a little different issue because um, the thing that, it, it, and I don't think it's a scientific issue, I think it's a, uh, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a fu uh, fundamental problem associated with the way medicine has, is, is practiced, number one, and the way medical devices are regulated. Because the fundamental issue around sequencing is it's called, it's hypothesis free, right? In contrast to this fungal pathogen idea is we can demonstrate to the regulatory agencies based on peer-reviewed data, what the genome is of a particular species of aspergillus that might be causing the infection that's known. We can show them our DNA probes and show that they will match, you know, C's, T's, A's, and G's, and all that stuff, right? And so they know that that's not hypothesis-free. If, if you're finding the DNA, then I know that your DNA probe is specific to that. Sequencing is different. It's hypothesis-free. You build the sequence from the bottom up, and the issue because just two weeks ago, we had a conversation at FDA about this particular topic. And they are struggling with the concept of hypothesis-free diagnostics where they can't validate as, the, as the, the, the test is performed or as the reaction occurs that it's actually occurring the right way. And um, you and I may understand the science about that, but that's not the way regula regulators think. So the reason why that's important is because in order for it to be widely adopted, reimbursed, and, and, and therefore used, then it has to be cleared by or, or approved by FDA for use. And so FDA is struggling with that fundamental issue. The second thing is the way medicine is practiced and the use of genetic data. Most uh, the, 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 the not scientific peer-reviewed data, but, but published data show that it's typically a 17-year period from the time when a discovery is made until it's adopted in clinical practice, right? So I, we, we have this saying at my company, remember the most powerful and expensive medical device in the healthcare system is the pen in the physician's pocket. What that pen does 
drives all costs in the healthcare system, right? And so as the, fa as the son and the brother and the brother-in-law of physicians, I will tell you that they, first of all, wake up every morning knowing that they are the smartest person on earth <coughs> and that there's not anything they can ever learn again, right? And the, what, the, everything that they had previously been taught, and I'm being, you know, hyperbolic for a reason, but, er, but, but another way of looking at that is that they're actually being, they're actually being, um, they're creatures of habit, right? And they're not gonna do something unless they're really confident that what they're doing is not just new, but better. And so it takes a long time for that to be implemented. But if they're less likely to um, prescribe a drug uh, that would have negative side effects, they, they are motivated to have an incentive to have that data. So that, that is one that potentially is a game changer for them because of how much, how much overhead is associated with liability insurance and how much they don't want to kill somebody accidentally by giving them a drug. So if they, if they could use sequencing data and had a good probability of thinking that that data screens out some segment of their patient base that's likely to have adverse effects, that's a huge motivator for them to adopt. Except that they have a lot of air cover with the label, right? With the drug label. So if they administer a drug and there's adverse events and it's, and it's on the drug label, then, and they counsel the patient as they always, they're good about this, right? They always, they always say, you know, here's what we're gonna do and here's why, and please understand these are the potential adverse, adverse effects. And so if they do all that and it's documented in the chart and all that stuff, then the liability is significantly diminished. On the other hand, if they, if they don't administer the drug because of, because of some sequence data or DNA mutation information that they have, and then the patient expires or you know, develop, moves, moves from stage two to three to four, then they're also concerned about that nature of liability, right? So, I mean, it's a pretty, it's a pretty complex issue for sure. Uh, Patrick, there's, uh, you mentioned a whole bunch of pharmaceuticals, or pharmaceutical companies are having blockbuster drugs come off patent. And then you also went that the replacement, in your mind, of individualized pharmacology. It seems like a pretty significant gap there in years. What are the pharmaceutical companies going to do in the interim? Um, I understand the profiles are like two or three or four years left. They're pretty desperately going. Um, uh, back into the earlier stage companies to buy up probable candidates. And yeah, so from two, the data are, and I have to go back and double check, but it's pretty close. Somewhere between 2012 and 2014, there's, I think, $82 billion of revenue in pharmaceuticals that are coming off patent, which will basically go from $82 billion to a small fraction of that relatively quickly. Um, and so the question is, what do they do about that? And I think the answer to that question is, frankly, what they, more of what they've been doing. Because the other piece of data is that over the past decade, 78% of the compounds that have been introduced by Big Pharma have not been developed by Big Pharma. They've been developed by smaller biotech companies who have been either, and they've either licensed in those compounds or they've acquired the company, the, small, the smaller company. And so. Um, I, the, the issue out of Big Pharma, I think, is R&D productivity and given the amount of money that they're spending, you know, how do they get, how do they get better results there? And different companies are taking, are taking different approaches. You know, Novartis, is, for example, has, has published, has talked about publicly about how they're turning things around and instead of starting with their library of compounds and then trying to push those compounds through to try to, to uh, identify uh, the effective mode of use for those compounds, they're actually starting from understanding cellular pathways and the way meta uh, 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 metabolism works based on the highest cost disease states and then reaching back the other way to try to, if they understand the cellular pathways, they can understand what, the, what inhibits those pathways and so on, and then they can reach back into their compound library and pull those through. Now whether that's going to be successful or not, I don't know. But a lot of those companies, like, like Novartis, are realizing what you're realizing, and they're, and they're taking new and different approaches to the way that they, they actually um, have, have developed compound. In terms of business opportunities, you said that uh, a lot of investment will be going to the R&D companies. What other areas do you, that you think will uh, benefit from this concept? Well, I think the, um, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of work to be done on the, on the discovery side. So, if you're doing, uh, if a company is doing some of the some of this type of um, 
fundamental discovery using whatever technologies they employ. In my judgment, that's a very nice opportunity. But I think um, the, in, in the healthcare field broadly defined, I think there's significant opportunities in healthcare IT. I think there's significant opportunities in medical, in medical devices. Uh, if you're, um, uh, one, of the, one of the areas that, or one of the pieces of advice I give people is to, to follow the money, right? And a significant portion of our healthcare dollar is spent on a very small number of, of uh, chronic disease states, things like diabetes and cardiovascular disease and so on, number one. And number two, a lot of our healthcare dollars are spent in the, at the very end of life. We've all heard those types of data. So, so diseases of the elderly with the aging of the population and a lot of these diseases we're talking about are, are environmentally driven, things like a lot of the diabetes issue is around diet and socioeconomics and, and type two or adult onset diabetes and, and the complications thereof and, and, uh, and the diseases of the elderly and so on. Um, in my judgment, I think all those areas are, are, are very attractive. I think you also have to make sure that you understand you align yourself with something that, that, um, that you find personally exciting. You know, I, 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 um, uh, one of the things I evaluated early in my career was, you know, did I want to move into pharmaceuticals and then from what I was in? And it just wasn't me, right? It, I mean, it's, it, it's a sort of business that is a very good business for a lot of people, but it, it's typically uh, moves a little more slowly than, than, than the way I like things to move. And so I would have gone crazy if I had done that. Uh, I have to tell you, I go crazy in my current job too, but for, diff for entirely different reasons. Lee? Uh, How do you think that's going to impact healthcare moving forward, um, especially since a lot of the data analysis is happening in-house? You're in-house at Mayo, for example? Uh, yeah, in-house at Mayo. Uh, ask your question a different way. I just want to make sure I understand this. Okay, they're, they're acquiring data from their patients so that they can better treat uh, future patients with similar with similarities. So either the age or or race or whatever it might be, so that they can help diagnose Correct. Right? So I guess going towards this whole uh, personalized healthcare, um, is it a two prong approach where healthcare uh, <coughs> hospitals are doing uh, going towards personalized healthcare and Yes, I think so. I mean, I, this, I, I, the prevailing term for what I was referring to during my prepared remarks is personalized medicine. I use that term because it's the prevailing term, but I can also tell you that everybody in the healthcare system who actually are healthcare providers, they already believe they're delivering personalized medicine, right? Meaning that the first thing that you're taught is to take the patient history and understand, you know, what what the individual in, uh, uh, factors may be that are unique and different to that, to that person. So I'm not sure I agree with the term itself, and I think what you're describing is what I'm referring to, which is there are a number of factors that can affect um, uh, the effectiveness of, of a particular therapeutic approach. One of the things on the list is a person's genetic profile, but it's not, certainly not the only one. I just think it represents a new and different and exciting and particularly informative tool. Um, and, and that's why the, the, uh, it, it's uh, on the cusp of being more widely adopted. There's a lot of people who don't think it's a very good idea, uh, this idea, that, th this concept that I was just talking about. Typically, you know, there are companies that make um, some of the compounds who, who are, that sell a lot but are not particularly effective. You know, the, the most recent study in the New England Journal, for example, is this class of drugs called statins, right, anti-cholesterol drugs, that the efficacy, efficacy rates of statins across, I think, a, a, a population of something like 11,500 people in this particular study, the efficacy rate, that is, the patients who benefited from taking it was something like 70, 71 percent. Now, that class of drug, in terms of uh, value, uh, spent 
uh, money spent is about a $25 billion class of drugs. So if you assume that in round numbers, 30% of it, because the efficacy rate's only 70%, 30% of the people taking that drug don't benefit, then the, the healthcare system is spending $7.5 billion for people to take drugs they're not benefiting from, which doesn't make any sense to anybody. But if you're selling, the, if, you're, if you're the market share leader in statins, you know, if somebody suggests, okay, let's, let's reduce that by, by 30% by implementing this personalized medicine idea, you know, they're not particularly excited about that. And, and I think, to, to be fair, I think most pharmaceutical companies, at least the ones that I know, and I know a lot of them quite well, they believe that this is fundamentally a really good thing because they're in the business of improving patients' lives and they take that very seriously. But it's also a real economic issue they have to, they have to, they have to deal with. So to your point, I think expanding the, the level of personalization of medicine using this, this, this tool uh, that I just talked about is, is, I would say, another tool in the toolbox of what is, what is a personal approach already. Patrick, I might just throw up a, a closing question here for career advice to people in the room moving forward in life sciences and healthcare. You kind of answered me when you answered the investment question. Where would you, where would you point people to go? Um, sort of the high growth areas. Again, you mentioned a little bit around the investment side. I think you could better articulate for that. Well, I think the. Um, uh, in terms of the, the, the types of companies to, uh, to look at, you know, the uh, capitalism being what it is, uh, there are a lot of companies who aren't on the Forbes list, right, uh, that are in our, in our industry. And so um, if, you, if you come to the conclusion that being in this industry is something that you want to investigate, then I think among the things to look at are uh, to study, let's start with the data. Uh, in this case, the financial data, and look at things like their R&D spend, um, as a, and, and in particular their R&D spend as a as a percent of revenue, um, and see whether that's changed dramatically over time. And if so, try to understand why. The reason why is because R&D is the lifeblood of this industry, and so if a company is not committed to spending in that area, then uh, their long-term prospects, in my view, are are are, in, are unsound. And the second thing is to look at the balance sheet, and, and, and if they're not profitable yet, to understand their cash burn. And um, you know, I think <laughs> uh, there's nothing like having a lot of cash. I will tell you, uh, my my company's profitable, and we're cash flow positive, and we you know we have more than a year's revenue in cash, so you know we're in good shape. But but understanding a company's financial health is real is really important. Um, and then the last thing, which is a little bit of a unique uh, approach, is Depending on what your personal background is, the other thing I would advise would be to look at the top management of the company and try to understand what their backgrounds are. And if you, t you move out of our industry for, for a while, if you look at General Motors and you look at the track record of the CEOs of those companies, the, 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 the CEOs of, of General Motors typically have what background? Finance, right? Almost all of them were former CFOs. Um, if you, on the other hand, if you look at HP, the only time HP really had a, an issue with an effective leader was when they brought in someone from the outside who wasn't an engineer, Carly Fiorina. And so that's an engineering culture. And so if you're an engineer and you want to go to work for HP, that's probably a good thing, right? But if, you're, and if, you, if you want to run the business, right? And most people aspire to do something like that. Uh, and so I think the other thing to think about in terms of culture um, is to understand what the background of the senior management of the company is, which is typically available on their website. And you can come to your own conclusions <laughs> about your long-term prospects there. Um, because if you're, if, if you're similar to those people that are running the company, typically if you believe the, the fundamental principle, and I do, that organizations have a tendency to take on the personalities of, of their leadership, then you know, you'll, you'll find in Luminex's case, I'm a sales and marketing guy by training. Yeah, I, I, I'm reasonably competent on the scientific side, but I'm a sales and marketing guy by training. The fundamental principle that we have, the principles that we run our company on starts with what we call the CAP principles, which is, and, and the C stands for customer. And so we're trying to solve customers' problems. That's what we get up every morning trying to do. And that's neither, that's neither good nor bad, it's just us. And so understanding what the, what the how a company does their business every day is important, and one of the best ways to look at that or to evaluate that, I think, is to evaluate the backgrounds of the people running the place. 